Now, coming to my question, I have a lot of interaction with Muslims because my early childhood and uh, youth was spent among them. But one question has always uh, been not really understood by me. The definition of Allah. Because to my mind and the way it has been given to me by my Muslim friends and acquaintances, that their definition of Allah basically is negation of other faiths and also non-acceptance of their definition of God as such. Your scholarship is very profound. I would like to be benefited by it. The brother asked a very good question, very important question, that he wants to know one thing which has been always in his mind. What is the definition of Allah in Islam? And the definition also includes many things which is negation and it contradicts the definition of the other faiths. In fact, in Islam, the definition of Allah says what Allah is and also says what Allah is not. Besides knowing what God is, it is also important to know what God is not. So that if someone falsely claims that so and so is God, you can easily come to know this is a false claim. As far as the reply to what is the definition of Allah, the best reply that any Muslim can give you is from the Quran from Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul Allahu Ahad. Say He is Allah one and only. Allah Samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakullahu kuffanad. There is nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, given in the glorious Quran. This is the touchstone of theology. It is the litmus test to identify any person says so and so candidate is God. If that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate to be God. The first is, Qul hu Allah ahad. Say it Allah one and only. Allah samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Walam yakullahu kufana. There is nothing like him. For example, I'll give you an example. There are some human beings who say that Bhagawan Rajneesh is God. During question answer time, there was a Hindu brother who told me that if Hindus don't consider him to be God. I never said that the Hindus call Bhagawan Rajneesh to be God. There are many human beings who claim Bhagawan Rajneesh is God. Now I will give you a sample. Why do we use this negative also? Like say is Allah one and only is positive. Allah samat, Allah the absolute eternal. Lam yalad wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Why do we use this? Now we'll put this Bhagawan Rajneesh to test. The first test is, Qul Allah was, says Allah one only. Was Bhagawan Rajneesh one and only? Was he the only man who has claimed divinity? There are hundreds who have claimed divinity. And in this country of ours, India, there are thousands of men who have claimed divinity. Thousands of people have said that they are God. He's not the only one. But Rajneesh Bhakt will say, no, Bhagawan Rajneesh is unique. So let's go to the next test. Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Was Rajneesh absolute and eternal? When we read his autobiography, we read there that Bhagwan Rajneesh, he was suffering from asthma, from diabetes mellitus, from chronic backache. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, from diabetes mellitus, from chronic backache. The third test, Lam Yulid Lam Yulad. He begets not noise begotten. We know Bhagwan Rajneesh, he was born in Madhya Pradesh and he had a mother and father and in 1981 he goes to America and takes thousands of Americans for a ride and in the state of Oregon he starts his new center known as Rajnishpuram. Later on the American government arrests him and puts him behind bars. Rajnish alleges that the American government gave me slow poisoning. Imagine almighty God being slow poisoned. And 1985, the American government kicks him out of the country. He comes back to India and goes back to the city of Pune. And there, he goes and restarts his center, which is today called as Osho Commune. And if you visit Osho Commune today, if you go to a Samadhi, where his ashes have been kept after he died, it is mentioned over there on a Samadhi, on a stone, Osho. Bhagwan Rajnish, oh show, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. Never born, never died, but visited the earth 
from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. They forgot to mention on his Samadhi that he was not given visas to 21 different countries of the world. Imagine Almighty God coming on this earth to visit different countries and requires visas. And the last test, Walam Yakulla Kufanad, is so stringent that the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. Walam Yakulla Kufanad. We know Bhagavan Rajnish. He had a white beard. Like the human being, he had two eyes, one nose, one mouth, two hands. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. Walam Yakulla Kufanad. For example, someone says that the Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You may have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title Mr. World, strongest man in the world, Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the universe. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, Dara Singh or King Kong, whether it be a thousand times or a million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. Walam Yakullahu Kufanad. So this brother is, in short, the concept of Almighty God. As far as the second part of the question is concerned, that why does it contradict with the concept of God in other religions? In fact, it's a misconception that the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, it contradicts with the other religions. It contradicts against the practices of the other religion, I agree with you, but does not contradict against the other religious scriptures. Because unfortunately, the followers of most of the religions, whether it be Christianity, Hinduism, etc., they do not read their own scriptures. So if we analyze the practices of the non-Muslims, it does contradict. But if you go back to the scripture, if you have to understand the concept of God in any religion, the best is to try and find out what that scripture of that religion has to speak about God. Don't try and find out the concept of God by observing what the followers of the religions do. For example, if you want to know the concept of God in Sikhism, the best place you can go is Guru Granth Sahib, Adi Granth. If you read the first volume, first chapter, first verse of Guru Granth Sahib, it is known as Japuji. What does it say? Correct, known as Japuji. It says that God is one. He is called the true. He is called as eternal. He is existent. He is compassionate. He's free from fear and want. And if you know in Sikhism, Sikhism believes in one God. It does not believe in idol worship. It does not believe in Autarvada. And in the manifest form, he's called as Ekomkara. And unmanifest form, he's called as Omkara. And if you read the scriptures of Sikhism, there are various attributes given to Almighty God. If you read the six scriptures, Almighty God, he's called as Satanama. He's called as holy name. He's called as Kartar, the creator. He's called as Rahim, merciful. He's called as Kareem, beneficent. He's also called as Wahe Guru, the one true God. So if you go back to the scripture, the concept of God in Sikhism and Islam is the same. Similarly, if you go to Hinduism, in Hinduism also, if you go back to the Hindu scriptures, it's clearly mentioned in the Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, Chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Ekkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Sveta Siddha Upanishad. Chapter number six, verse number nine. Nacha sekasej, janita na chadipa. Of that God, there are no parents. He has got no superior. He has got no Lord. It's mentioned in Sveta Siddha Upanishad. Chapter number four, verse number 19. As well as Yajur Ved. Chapter number 32, verse number three. Na trasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima in Sanskrit means, it means an image, a photograph, a painting, a picture, a portrait, an idol, a statue, a sculpture. So it says, Na tasir patima asti, of that God, there is no image, there is no painting, there is no portrait, there is no photograph, no sculpture, no idol, no statue. But unfortunately, yet you find that Hindus are doing idol worship. Who's to blame? I'm quoting the Vedas. Vedas is the highest authority amongst all the Hindu scriptures. But yet you find that Hindus do idol worship. Why? Because the scholars of Hinduism, they tell that, see, Brother Zakir, you know, at the lower level, people don't understand, so for concentration, we require the idol. When we reach a higher level of consciousness, then idol is not required. So I tell this Hindu Pandit, 
we Muslims have already reached the higher level of consciousness. It is the basis of Hinduism, basis of Vedas. But there are some sects in Hinduism, like Arya Samaj, which completely denounce idol worship. So similarly, if you go to Christianity, if you read the Christian scriptures, Christian scriptures are against idol worship. Yet you find that the Catholics, they make an image of God, and they say, Jesus Christ, peace be upon the Almighty God. So what we realize, that if you go to the Christian scriptures, the Christianity and Islam, the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is similar. But most of the Christians, what they claim that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God, always worship me. If any Christian can point out any unequivocal, any unambiguous statement in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's clearly mentioned. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, My father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29. My father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28. I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, the will of Almighty God is a Muslim. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was a Muslim. He never claimed divinity. And it's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. Ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did by him and you are witness to it. So if you read the Bible, even in Judaism and Christianity, they believe in one God who has got no images. It's clearly mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9. It says that thou shall have no other God besides me. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image of anything, of any likeness in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, thy God, thy Lord is a jealous God. For more details, you can listen to the talk of my son. Tomorrow my son at 3.45 is going to be a detailed talk. This was just highlights. On the same topic, concept of God in major world religions. And you'll find out it is the same. We believe in one God who has got no images and we worship him alone and no one else. Hope that answers the question. My beloved brothers and sisters, here you have seen a Sikh man in India has asked Dr. Zakir Naik the definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is Allah? And Dr. Zakir Naik has beautifully answered his question and gave him the definition. Allah himself has given his definition in one of the chapters in the Quran which is known as Surah Ikhlas and in that Surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in short he has given his definition who he is the nourisher, the cherisher, the sustainer, the creator and he is our Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my beloved brothers and sisters, whenever you get to know a non-Muslim, it might be your friends, your colleagues, or someone you know, try to give them da'wah. Tell them about Islam. Tell them about the beauty of this religion. Let them know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And call them to Islam if anybody converts to Islam because of your da'wah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you immensely any good deed they do you'll get the similar reward without any reward being deducted from him or her Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said balligu anni walaw aya spread from me even if it is a single verse 
So if you know at least something about Islam, try to give da'wah to others and send the message of Islam to them. And make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that Allah uses you for his deen. May Allah forgive our shortcomings. May Allah give barakah in the work of the da'is. May Allah give us the ability to do good deeds and to call people towards Islam. And may Allah grant us Jannatul Fardaus Al-A'la. Help us build an Islamic studio at www.islamicstudio.org. Link in the description.